them. And here I must apologize to our deaf people in the audience because I'm going to play a section of a video in which a young woman who is British and deaf talks, she has a cochlear implant, she talks and she describes uh, what she can hear with her cochlear implant, what's going on inside her head. Uh, um, what she's going to do, we'll hear her, um, she's, go she's going to talk about what a professor is saying in a lecture and how she actually, what's actually going on auditorily in her brain. Uh, so, um, and the words that she's saying are across the bottom. But unfortunately, you, you won't be able to see the vast difference between what a hearing person hears and what a cochlear imp implant person has going on inside their head. Um, so let's play this. Future. Um, this is what you hear. Were either to just move the left finger, a little finger wibbly on the left, on the left side of space. This is the auditory the input right that cochlear implant provides me. My brain has to work over time to fill in the gaps so that I can understand the complex information the lecturer is conveying. So much of my brain processing power is used in just keeping up with the lecture, I cannot take my own notes. As a result... Okay, I, I hope that was shocking to you, um, those of you who are hearing. And um, for those of you who are deaf, uh, I, I promise you, I, I promise you that um, the uh, what uh, the hearing person received and what the cochlear imp implant person received auditorily, they were that far apart. The work of someone who has a cochlear implant, the work they have to do to decipher what the implant is providing them is enormous. It's a constant job. Um, the, the person in this video was 19 months old when uh, she was implanted. Um, uh, uh, she, uh, sorry, I, oh, I wrote this wrong. She was 19 months old when she went deaf. She was three years old when she was implanted. I wrote this wrong. But by 19 months, she had already learned a lot about sounds. Um, as you know, 18 months is that plasticity period. Children are getting it all, all the sounds of their language by 18 months. And, um, and uh, so she was already quite advanced. Um, and she's very easy to understand. She speaks beautifully. It was a shock to me to understand how hard it was for her to decipher things because I didn't know what a cochlear implant was delivering. Um, when you get a cochlear implant, you have to be trained for hours and hours, every day, every week, every month, every year, throughout your childhood. This is a lot of time spent on just interpreting the information that the cochlear implant gives your brain. Um, the, uh, as you pass childhood, uh, you have to return for some rehabilitation. Um, 
maybe every couple of years, maybe every three years. Uh, it depends on, on you. Some people it's longer. I had somebody um, tell me that he goes back for rehabilitation when he watches people's faces as he's talking and he can tell they have no idea what he's saying. Then he knows he has to go back for training again. Uh, um, but it is a constant thing and it takes a team of people to do it. The parents have to be involved in it. Um, an audiologist is involved. The child is working all the time. Sometimes there's a language specialist. What I mean by a language specialist is someone who's a specialist in the cognitive facility of language. Unfortunately, there isn't always a language specialist on a cochlear implant team because of this confusion that some people have between speech and language. And they think if they've got a speech therapist, they've got a language specialist. Well, they don't. You need a language specialist in there. Um, uh, the factors that influence cochlear implant success, the optimal condition is that you be very, very young when you get it, under 18 months. Unless, of course, you were born hearing and then you lose your hearing, then, you know, if you lose your hearing at four, you're a very good candidate at four. If you lose your hearing at eight, you're a very good candidate at eight. But if you're born deaf, it's the earlier, um, the better. Also, some implant apparatuses, the actual mechanical thing, have better success than others. Also, some sites for the surgery, um, some different places that they do the surgery, have better success than others. Um, uh, regular training, if, if there's breaks in the training at any point, forget it. It's absolutely regular training. Um, and you have to have the best family characteristics. You have to have a family that's totally behind it, absolutely going to work. The whole family's going to work on helping this child get the training that the child needs. And it goes with socioeconomic status of the family. The richer the family is, the better education the family has, the better chance the child has of doing well with a cochlear implant. Still, even if you take the child who has all the optimal conditions, and most children don't, okay? But let's take the child who has all the optimal conditions. Still, the results are variable. And when I say they're variable, I mean they are variable. One kind of cochlear implant person we call a star. That's a person who can vocalize and receive speech through speech reading, through context, um, through guessing, um, uh, well enough to have conversations with strangers, okay? That's your very best situation. Those we call the stars. I'm going to say some figures here and then I'll talk about them. About 20% of the children who have the optimal conditions are stars. That's not very many. Then you have the next group. The next group are people who cannot have conversations with strangers. The strangers have no idea what they're saying and they don't know what the stranger is saying to them but they can have conversations with family members. They learn to read their family members' speech. And their family members learn to understand what they're saying. And this can be very valuable to someone. Of course, it's very valuable to be able to communicate with your family members. And 
close friends, you know, so family members and close friends, people you see all the time. Well, what if your father decides to grow a mustache? Suddenly you have trouble understanding him, you know? Um, let's say your aunt has a stroke and one side of her mouth doesn't move anymore. You can't understand her at all. Um, uh, the, 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 that is, it's still work. This child is working very hard. That's about 20% of the kids, okay? Then we have this next group. The next group is uh, people who can distinguish speech from non-speech. So they can know at least when someone is talking to them and they can grab a piece of paper and write, you know, um, uh, I'm deaf, please write uh, what you have to say to me. Um, and that can help them, that, 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 that is useful. But they can't catch any words that, uh, you know, maybe they can catch one here, one there. But in general, they can't do it, even with family members. That's another 20%. Okay, now we're down here to the next group. The next group are kids who can't distinguish speech. They, they can't do that, but they can distinguish the rumble of a truck going down a road or um, a, a, a fire alarm or, um, you know, a siren. That they, they can distinguish these things, which can be very helpful, especially to a child. It can be helpful, it can save your life. Um, but they're getting no language help. Then you go down, that's about 20%. And you go down to the last group, the, the bottom 20%, all they have in their head is noise. Just noise. Um, uh, uh, now, where did I get these figures of 20, 20, 20, 20, 20? Um, I got them just really from talking to um, teams, cochlear implant teams at hospitals, trying to get something to understand what's going on. But when you look at the literature, it's very hard to come to that conclusion. Um, what I'm saying is that 60% of the children who get cochlear implants are not getting language. Only those stars and the kids who communicate with their family, they're getting language. But the rest of them are not getting language. Now, why do I believe that? I believe that because of a huge study that was done in 2010. In 2010, a study was done of thousands of people who had received cochlear implants in the year 2000. Um, uh, I, I think it was 2005 and following, okay? So they were recent people who had gotten cochlear implants. Um, and, uh, and they had all gotten cochlear implants before the age of 12 months. And in this study, um, uh, of all of these thousands of kids, 60 um, something percent of them, I think it's 63 percent, but it's somewhere around that, low 60s, had thrown away their cochlear implants. They were no longer using it. You don't throw away something that's useful to you. You know, think about that. You don't throw away something that's useful to you. And being able to communicate with the people around you is so important. I mean, it's, it's what you need in order to be a human being. Um, and uh, you're surrounded by hearing people. You're surrounded by people who are speaking. If your cochlear implant is helping you to communicate with those people, you're not going to give it up. A little kids don't give up something because it's hard. Look, watch a kid learn to ride a bike, you know? They get on that bike over and over again. They smash themselves up. They don't care. They know that they want to ride that bike. So if they're giving up their cochlear implant, they're not getting anything from it. And that was more than 60% of the children had given it up. They, they weren't getting anything. Um, so 
uh, uh, that's why uh, what I think. Um, it's very hard to look at the medical literature and really come up with clear percentages. We need to do a meta study of the medical literature, but it's hard. Why? A lot of the literature on cochlear implants is supported by the cochlear implant manufacturers. They are not subject to the same rules of disclosure that studies done under a federal grant, for example, are subject to. For example, in a study on cochlear implants, they'll say this many children entered, maybe a hundred children entered the study. But by the end of the study, there were only 43. And they tell you what, how the 43 are faring. They can, don't have to tell you why the other children dropped out. They're not required to tell you that. You don't know whether those children dropped out because they stopped using their cochlear implant. It meant nothing to them. Or because they were doing badly and the study encouraged them to, to not come. We don't, we don't know. We just don't know. So if you're only looking at 43 out of these 100, maybe it's the top 43. Um, and in these studies, they're crazy. <laughs> the studies will do things, they'll say, this child is having success with a cochlear implant. Why? Because when we say a sentence to that child, the child can tell us how many syllables are in that sentence. The child can tell us how, how many syllables are in a word. If I say international, 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 the child can say there are five syllables. That's not language. That's beats. That's not language. If the child can't recognize the word, but can only count the syllables, how can you say that that's language success? Often the things that they're measuring are not language. Um, they are auditory, but they are not language. Uh, so uh, it, it's very difficult. That's why I don't come to you with exact percentages, because they're not available. Um, okay, uh, the other thing, so there's variable success, and the other thing is we can't predict who's going to be successful. So if you give your child a cochlear implant and you don't give them a sign language, you're taking a huge risk. You don't know. You could work and work and work. You could be the richest person in the world, the smartest person in the world, and maybe your child's not going to get language. Um, uh, uh, it's impossible to predict. Why? You know, a lot of people will say, oh, come on, cochlear implants have been around for a while. They have to be much better now. And every year they have to be getting better. It's not true. When I was a kid, a computer filled a room, gigantic things. Today, a computer can be the size of a driver's license and is thin. You know, we've made huge advances in computer technology. We've made huge advances in machines. Mm -hmm. But with a cochlear implant, it isn't just making advances in the apparatus. We need to understand the brain. It has to interface with the brain. It's not a machine doing something that a machine can do. It's a machine trying to give information to a human brain. 
so the human brain can do what it needs to do. That's a hard job. And we simply don't know enough about the human brain to do a good job with cochlear implants. That's where we are. And I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. So, so here you have it. 